I'm going to talk about uh, analyzing performance data using Julia and D3. Uh, it's going to be a little bit about D3, a little bit about Julia, a lot about communication between the two, uh, and how we achieve that using the tools available today. My name is Philip. I work for a company called Sosta. We do web performance analysis and load testing. Uh, I created a JavaScript library called Boomerang. It's open source under the BSD license. Uh, the purpose of Boomerang is to collect uh, real user performance data. So as a user browses websites, it measures how long that site took to load. And then uh, we beacon it back to our servers, collect that data, and then do a lot of analysis in Julia. So I'm not going to talk about Boomerang today. I'm going to be talking about the analysis we do with Julia and how we visualize those, uh, that data using D3, right? <clears throat> so uh, you can get set up if you want to work along with me. Uh, that's probably the best way to get through this. So um, there is this link. It's a Google Docs link, um, bit.ly slash fluent Julia D3. And if you open that, you can make a copy of uh, the notebooks in there. And then we'll later import it into your Julia Box account. So once you've done that, uh, visit juliabox.org. <clears throat> there should be a uh, button that says sign in with your Google account. So I'm actually going to do that myself right now. <clears throat> and this is a little hard for me to see, because if I have mirroring turned on, I can't see my slides. And if I have it turned off, I can't see the browser. Can anyone tell me which is my Gmail one? Is it the middle one? Gmail. That's Gmail. All right. Is it doing so? I'm going to go back to the slides while that loads up. So has anyone else managed to sign into Julia Box? I have, yeah. Yeah, a few people. All right. So there should be a sync tab on the, on the top. If you click on that uh, and try to sync from a Google account, you can uh, either enter the bit.ly link at the top or put in your copy of that. So the sync link is up here. And if you click on that, uh, you can add. So you can paste your URL here, and then click on the Add button. I'll give it a local name. So I, I picked Fluent as the local name. That, that way, all of your examples uh, will have the same uh, paths as mine. Right? And then click on the Add button. It should then start syncing. And then if you go back to the main tab, it should show you a Fluent directory, which you just added, and the Tutorials directory, which comes into all Julia Box accounts when you first set it up. Right. So let me know when you've got past that step. Does everyone have uh, this account, uh, this directory set up? Not yet? It's taking a while to sign up? All right. So if you get a 500, you might need to reload. Uh, Julia Box is uh, it's hosted on uh, Google App Engine, but I don't think they put in too much. It's a free project, so it's as much as they can afford. <laughs> 
So these files are also available on GitHub. If you don't want to do it right now, you just want to clone it. Or even if, you've, uh, if you by some chance happen to have uh, Julia installed on your own machines, uh, you can get the files using GitHub. Uh, the link is down at the bottom. It's uh, bit.ly slash gh dash julia dash d3. All right. So while people get set up, I'll, I'll go into a little bit about what Julia and D3 are, and uh, then we'll actually get into the meat of things. Is anyone here familiar with Julia already? What about R? All right, Python? JavaScript? All right. <laughs> so Julia is a high-level language, much like uh, Python and JavaScript. I would also call R a high-level language, except its syntax is fairly obtuse. So it's, uh, it's kind of not exactly. Um, it's a high-level, high-performance dynamic programming language. So you can write high-level code. It's uh, vectorized, so all data structures and all algorithms that it deals with already uh, understand vectors. And can, so you can take like a matrix and multiply it just with a single operation instead of actually writing the algorithm to multiply. It borrows heavily from R and Python and somewhat from MATLAB. So if you're familiar with one of these languages, uh, the syntax will look familiar to you. It's got performance comparable to C. In benchmarks, uh, the only language that has outperformed Julia is Fortran, uh, specifically for math operations. Right? Um, it's designed for parallelism and cloud computing. So you, it actually has the ability built into the language to spin up multiple kernels across multiple hosts and communicate with them. So it's not something that you require a plugin for. It's already part of the language. Right. And uh, like I said, it's, um, it operates on vectors. It also has uh, built-in support for SIMD. That's uh, CPU-level optimizations to send multiple, uh, multiple data sets with a single instruction to the CPU and operate on them in parallel. So it gives you great performance. It's MIT license, which is typically safe for uh, most people to use, right? <clears throat> All right, who here is familiar with D3? All right, that's good. So D3 is a JavaScript library uh, that maps data to DOM nodes. A lot of people think of D3 as a visualization library. It is not a visualization library. It specifically maps data onto DOM nodes. Now those DOM nodes could happen to be visualization nodes like uh, SVG elements or uh, divs that have color or something, or a table, but that's not its intent. Its intent is to map data onto DOM nodes, and as that data ma gets manipulated, the DOM nodes will just follow in sync. Right. It's extended via layouts and uh, plugins, so you can do rich data visualizations and analysis. Uh, so you can have like a, a bar chart or a uh, a force-directed layout chart, a tree map, lots of different layouts that, are, that come uh, built into the D3 bundle. Um, you can also do an analysis like a, it can generate a histogram or it can do some amount of clustering within a D3 itself. Uh, you still need to draw the, uh, write the code to draw things. So you might be able to use something that, uh, examples that exist, and most people do that. They'll just uh, copy things off the website and that gives you a visualization. But if you think about it, you actually have to write that code. It doesn't, it's not like calling a single function. Now you could use libraries like C3 or D3 Plus that are built over D3 and do the visualization for you. Um, but all of them have their limitations and their advantages. So depending on what works for you. I'm gonna talk specifically about D3, how you map data onto DOM nodes and then translate that into some kind of visualization. On its own, D3 is pretty fast because it doesn't actually deal with much of the DOM. It deals with mapping data to DOM nodes. But it's very easy for you to write code that will make D3 slow. And uh, that's what happens uh, when we started using a lot of the examples that uh, were on the D3 website. And we started applying it. Uh, when you apply it to things like 1,000 data points, it works fine. When we started applying it to a million data points, it did not work as well. So you, you cannot actually use those in production. You can use it in, uh, in examples. D3 is BSD licensed, again, uh, fairly safe to use. <clears throat> so now, uh, 
how do we use Jupyter and D3 together? So Jupyter is uh, the thing you saw in uh, Julia box. Has everyone got set up by now? Anyone still having trouble getting set up with Julia box? Still having trouble? Uh, which step are you on? Importing. All right. So you're pretty close to getting there. Yeah, you could use the GitHub one also to sync. But... Oh, yeah, so from Julia, uh, from Git, uh, Julia Box, you can either sync with a Google Drive or a GitHub uh, URL. But, but if you have the, if you have the yeah, they're both identical, so you don't need to worry. So now, how does uh, Jupyter and uh, D3 work together? How, do, how are we planning on making it work together? So Jupyter on its own, we're going to consider it a black box. We don't really care how it works internally. But what it does is it communicates with a Julia kernel on the back end. And in fact, you could communicate with a Python kernel or a R kernel or any other kernel that you wanted to plug in on the back end. Uh, Julia box itself comes with Python and Julia kernels. Um, and you, you could uh, have code that's running uh, partially in one kernel and partially in another. In our case, we're only going to use Julia. So it communicates with the Julia kernel and sets up a web socket uh, with a browser. So initially, uh, well, there's a, a main HTML page that you have, but then that HTML page uh, has JavaScript that sets up a web socket that communicates directly with the kernel. So when you enter code in your notebook on, in your browser, that gets sent to the kernel, it executes in the kernel, and it's sent back using a web socket protocol that uh, the Jupyter team have designed. What we are going to do is write some more JavaScript that sits in the browser and communicates with D3 that's running inside an iframe. All right? And I'm going to explain a little bit about why we use an iframe and uh, how we communicate between the two. So that's, uh, again, Julia Box. I'm guessing everyone's done. So we're going to start with the basic Julia tutorial that's uh, looking at the notebooks that you should now have in your Julia box under the Fluent directory. So we're going to look at uh, right at the start. This is typically not the order you do, uh, go through when you're doing a Julia tutorial. Uh, JSON is typically not covered in any tutorials. I'm going to start with it because our purpose is to communicate with JavaScript, and JSON's the best way. So we're going to do JSON and JavaScript. Then we're going to look at some matrix op uh, operations, mainly because that's very useful for doing data analysis. Um, then we're going to look at uh, stats functions and data frames, <clears throat> and then uh, actually communicating with the DOM. Right. So I'm going to switch to Julia Box, and I'm going to go inside Fluent, and let's open the first notebook. So if I click on that. So is uh, anyone who, who here is familiar with the notebook interface? All right, just a couple of people. So notebooks are fairly common with um, people doing uh, well, a lot of science. Uh, for example, if you're in the biological sciences and you do a lot of experiments in the lab, you will have a notebook that's similar to this where you write down your protocols and your results and all of that. Uh, for math and physics people, uh, a notebook that has a programming language tied to it is very useful because they can enter the algorithms they've used and the output they've got. So uh, this is typically what a notebook looks like. It's got a bunch of input fields. Uh, you can also select the type of field, whether it's code or it's markdown if you want to just type in text, uh, something else, so that it, uh, you can pretty format and actually use this as your report or put it into your thesis or something like that. So the first thing we do for this notebook is we type in using JSON. And now to execute a single cell, you can either choose from the uh, menu cell and run the cell well, right, right here, or you can use the keyboard shortcut of shift enter or command enter or on Windows control enter. Right. So if I do that, it now imports the JSON module into this kernel's memory space, and now I can use any JSON functions. So I'm not going to use it just now. What I'm going to do is first define a matrix. So again, I'm going to do a shift enter there, and it's going to execute that code. Now, notice the way we define the array here. Uh, the first three array elements are separated by spaces. Then there's a semicolon, and then there's three more elements. So spaces basically separate uh, elements within the same row. 
semicolons indicate a new row. So you can, you can define a two-dimensional matrix just like that using this simple notation, right? Uh, if you wanted to use one-dimensional matrix, you could either use spaces or use commas to separate them. Depending on uh, which you use, it'll create either a column uh, vector or a row vector, right? Now, Jason is, uh, sorry, Julia is a columnar-based uh, language, so all of its data structures are primarily columnar. If you have an array, iterating through uh, columns is actually faster than iterating through rows. So uh, you'll actually notice an order of magnitude difference if you have like a, rec a database uh, stored in memory, a data frame stored in memory, you try to iterate through it in rows versus columns, uh, there's an order of magnitude difference. So anyway, we've got this uh, matrix here and we'll now encode it as JSON just using the JSON.JSON function. And that's all it does. It, so it's now a JavaScript representation of the same data structure. Um, in double quotes, because typically when we say JSON, we want a string back, right? So JSON is a serialized version of a JavaScript object. So this is a string containing a JavaScript object and we can assign this to a a variable using uh, json.parse in JavaScript, right? So <clears throat> this is fairly simple JSON, but things can get complicated if you use things like data frames. Again, because uh, Julia is columnar, what it, it's gonna generate a really complex data structure. So we'll look at ways of simplifying that uh, in, a, a little, uh, in a little while. So now, how, how do we send this data to the client? Uh, we have JSON, and now we want to spit out JavaScript. Um, because of uh, this notebook interface, we can print out any HTML that we want, and it'll get rendered by the browser as HTML. And you need to be careful of this uh, because you could easily XSS yourself, right? Or if you throw open your uh, Julia uh, notebook to anyone, to somebody who doesn't have credentials, they could XSS you. So uh, be careful of that. Julia has, uh, the, the notebook server itself has no security built in. It's designed to be a single user system, so you have it on your box and you do not give access to anyone outside. But a lot of people just give access to people, they put it on their web servers and give, it, give access without credentials, so don't do that. <laughs> so the code I use here is uh, display uh, text HTML, telling uh, iJulia the content type that I'm trying to display, and then I print out HTML. So in this case, my HTML is just a JavaScript node. And what I'm gonna do is execute that. And you see it, it doesn't do anything because a JavaScript node is really invisible to the, to the browser, right? Uh, but what I'll do is if I inspect this here, I now notice the script tag is added here and it's added this JavaScript. And this JavaScript is gonna write something to the console. So if I inspect my console, my array has now been transferred to JavaScript. Can everyone see that or is it too small? All right. So everyone with me so far? All we've done so far is we've created an, a data structure in Julia and then transferred it to the, J, uh, to the JavaScript running in the client, which means we can now use that JavaScript to render something in the browser. Right? This was a fairly simple example, not uh, incredibly useful, but it, it shows us how this thing works. So let's move on to the second one where we'll actually do some, we'll learn some operations on matrices. All right. So again, I create a matrix. And then uh, there's some interesting operators. So Julia actually supports uh, full Unicode uh, operators. So any, any symbol can be used as an operator. Uh, you define it uh, like a method. And if it takes in a single argument, then you can uh, post fix it. If it takes in two arguments, you can infix it. So in this case, the, the prime operator is uh, the transpose operator. You can either call the transpose method or you can use the prime, and if I do that, it'll invert it. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, like we use in math, we typically say uh, a raised to minus one is uh, the invert operator. That's not true in, uh, well, that is true in Julia, except uh, the minus one uh, 
uh, as a superscript, that Unicode character is not the same as the raised to minus one, which is a, the math operator. So do not use this. Instead, use this notation if you want to invert a matrix. So that's what I get. Now, there's also a dot operator. I can either call it dot to do a dot product between two matrices. I can use the dot dot operator, or I can use the Unicode single dot, which you can get in Julia by typing backslash c dot and hitting the tab key. So any LaTeX uh, shortcuts, if you type in the LaTeX and hit the tab, it'll convert it to the actual character, and you can use that as an operator. This uh, works both in uh, in the Julia, uh, the the notebook server, as well as if you have uh, any of the Julia, if you're using Vim or uh, a different editor, and you install the Julia plugin for that, it'll expand it within your editor as well. Right? So it's pretty cool that way. Uh, if you can't, of course, there is the you can just use the dot function. Now, one thing to note is that uh, this works well for one-dimensional um, matrices. So if you're doing the dot product between two one-dimensional vectors, that's fine. Up to Julia 0.3, it actually worked for multi-dimensional as well. They changed it with 0.4 to improve performance. So you now need to specify that this is a vector operation. So we use the vec dot, and we can pass in two matrices. And in this case, if we do a vector multiplication between the matrix and its inversion, it gives us uh, the result of three, which is basically the, the sum of the identity matrix. Everyone with me so far? Am I going too much into math or too much into <laughs> Julia? Right. So similarly, the cross product is uh, got by the times operator, so backslash times tab, or you can use cross. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, um, but the rules for matrix multiplication hold. So. Here's what I have with the uh, vectors, the two vectors I've created, and I can run various set operations. So the intersection operator or the union operator is going to give me whatever what you think it would, right? So just simple set operations. I can also do the in operator, not in operator, uh, et cetera. Then I can concatenate uh, different vectors either horizontally. So if I concatenate them horizontally, it creates a new bigger vector. If I concatenate them vertically, it creates a matrix of the two vectors. Right. Now, interestingly, if you add a scalar to a vector, so if you take uh, something like what we have here, where uh, we had the matrix and we just add two to it, what it'll do is it'll iterate through every element, adding two to that element. And it'll do this using a vector operation. So to the CPU, it'll send all of the data to the CPU as one uh, set and send a single instruction. Well, not all of the data, but it'll send about 16 numbers to uh, 16 instructions together to the CPU with a single uh, add instruction, and the CPU sends them all back at once. So it happens pretty fast, uh, especially for large matrices. When you're dealing with like a million cross matrix, it's way faster than doing it one at a time. All right. Uh, similarly with multiplication. Um, and then there is the VEC operator. So if you have an array, typically if you're reading, so you got JSON back from the browser, that might not be a vector, it might be an array. So the important thing, to the difference is that a vector is a column-based, where array might be row-based. So if you need to convert that to a column, since Julia deals with columns, you use the VEC method to convert an array to a column num matrix. All right. All right. So we're actually going to stop with uh, matrix operations there. Right? That's, that's all I'm going to talk about matrices. Um, it's useful when you're doing analysis, but you don't need to go into too much detail because uh, there's actually functions to do a lot of things for us. Data frames are the interesting thing because what we can do with Julia is connect to a database, pull data out, and store it in data frame, and then operate on the individual columns of that data frame as if they were uh, matrices or data arrays, right? So you start off with, uh, by using the data frames package. And then uh, what I've done is I've uh, stored some of our data, anonymized data, in a file called data.csv. That's also part of that uh, um, Google Docs account. Um, so if you use read table on that, 
uh, you'll get in, in a data frame, right? And that data frame should contain uh, 250,000 records. So those of you who've done this from GitHub, let me know if it does not contain 250,000 records. It might be an older version of the file. So in order to find out how many records are in there, we run the size, met, uh, size function. So that tells us there's 250,000 records and 20 columns. Same on GitHub? All right, cool. And you can also use the names method to find out the names of all the columns in there. So what we see here is a whole bunch of uh, elements, and it's an array of symbols. Right? So that's a data type that's uh, part of Julia. It's called a symbol data type. Uh, typically, a string pre prefixed by a colon is a symbol. Uh, if you need to use uh, it's something like an enum in other languages. Think of it as similar to a symbol in Julia, except you don't have to declare a, a symbol in advance. The first time you use it is when that symbol is defined. Right? So you can directly assign uh, to an array uh, using a rather data frame using a symbol, and that symbol is created in memory. It takes up much less memory than the equivalent string of it. And you can convert between a string and a symbol using either the string method or the symbol method to convert one to the other. Now, when you're defining a symbol, you cannot use spaces, but you can use the symbol method with the uh, spaces in the string to create one that uh, you just cannot reference manually. Right? So it's, it's not very useful, but uh, some people do use it so to make sure there's no collisions with things people have uh, typed in. Right? So each column of a data frame is a data array. Think of a data, array, uh, data frame as a collection of data arrays. So each data array is one column. And this is why it's faster to iterate through a column. So you can just pull out a single column. And think of it as, if you're doing SQL, you typically do not do a select star. Who does a select star? Cool. Nobody, right? <laughs> so you, you should select only a few columns. And this is why, in, uh, in the case of Julia, and in fact, any column in a database, if you pull out a column, it's way faster than pulling out everything and then iterating through it. You can just pull out one column. It actually has con uses contiguous memory rather than multiple columns, which are in independent uh, memory locations. So in this case, uh, what I'm looking at is the timers T done, which uh, for our load uh, our performance data is the time it took to load up a web page. So there's 250,000 elements in here. Uh, and you see they're all different load times, so six seconds. These are all in milliseconds, by the way. So we have six seconds, 5.9 seconds, 14 seconds. Does anyone have web pages that take 14 seconds to load? So we actually see data that goes up to things like 600,000 seconds. So pages that actually take 10 minutes to load. Right. Facebook, <laughs> possibly. Uh, you can look at a slice of this uh, particular data array. So in this case, looking at just the elements from 30 to 40. Or I can look at the entire data frame looking at only uh, a subset of the columns that I have. So in this case, I given an array of the column names I want to look at, and it pulls out just those and gives me a new data frame. Right. So in this place, yeah, sorry? Um, these are the rows. So this is the column name, and these, this is the row, name, row numbers, right? Sorry? So it's in the order in which I fetched it from the database or from the file, right? It doesn't change the order unless I sort it specifically. In, in the table, yeah. So in the, in the CSV in this case. And if I were doing an SQL query, I would specify the order by and it would be in that order, right? Now, uh, there is an, a special key called end. So I can just say end, and I could say end minus 30, and it'll give me the last 30 elements. All right, so let's do end minus 10 here. So these are the last 11 elements, right? Starting from end minus 10 to end. 
Another important thing to note with uh, Julia is arrays are one based, not zero based. So if you're used to programming in C or JavaScript and all your arrays start at zero, they do not start at zero in, in Julia, they start at one. All right. uh, this is not a problem when you're using JSON to communicate because array indexes are not uh, passed across. But when you're writing code and you have one window open with JavaScript and one window open with uh, Julia, it's easy to get lost in uh, which array indexes you're talking about. <laughs> so uh, this is how you get the last few ones. Uh, I typically use the things like the map uh, function. So in both Julia and JavaScript, you can use map and various other array methods to iterate through things that you don't have to think about the actual index. You can just use the index as a parameter. So that works quite well. Um, So again, we uh, get a list of columns here. We can run a few stats. So there is a summary stats method that you pass in an array of numbers. It'll get you a summary of those numbers. So things like the mean, the minimum, median, maximum, and the quartiles. So these are useful if you just want to know some stats about it. But you might want to do more interesting things like uh, get the 20, 20th percentile or get the geometric mean. So you'll actually have to, uh, there are actually other functions to the, do that. Like you can do a geometric mean function uh, to get the data out, or you can get a certain percentile. Um, I'm not gonna go into those because there's documentation. The Julia docs are pretty good. They just do not have actual code examples, which I find is the most interesting thing about docs. But um, being written by, I think, more stats people rather than programmers, it's, uh, it's geared towards them. The histogram function is uh, one that uh, is useful to me when I'm analyzing performance data. So if I take an, a data array and I pass it to the hist function, it gives me um, back, in this case, this is the histogram. So it gives me an array of elements in equal size buckets. And then the first part that it, passes, it tells me is the size of these buckets. So in this case, it's kind of useless to me because uh, the bucket size is 200,000 milliseconds. Um, so this is what's called, in Julia, this is called a range. Um, so you actually can specify a range as a, a data type. Uh, unlike an, uh, actually specifying an array of numbers, you can just specify a range saying, this is from 0 to 2.6 E6, right? so 2.6 million, uh, with a 200,000 step. And that's a very quick way of specifying an array that's 200 million or 2 million elements in size. Right? It just takes up that much memory that uh, the range would take. Uh, but anyway, this is telling me that this, um, it's created a histogram with a bucket size of 200,000, starting from 0 and ending at 2 million, which for me is very useless because the majority of my data is between 0 and 10 seconds. Well, zero and 10,000 milliseconds. So two million is way too uh, far for me. And you can tell from this histogram here, um, which is not yet visualized, but I think the numbers speak for themselves. It's the first bucket has got 249,000 records out of my 250,000 records, right? So la the bulk of them are in my first bucket, and then the last uh, rest of the buckets have nothing. So what I might want to do is create thresholds based on the data itself. And this is something that we started doing at SOSTA. As we, we look at the data and we try and figure out what is the optimum buckets for this particular data set. So we do something called IQR filtering. Uh, is anyone here familiar with IQR filtering? All right. There is a Wikipedia article about it. And that's where I learned everything about it from. So I'm going to try and summarize it. Uh, <clears throat> who's familiar with percentiles? All right. Uh, 25th percentile, 75th percentile. So if you take all of your data points, sort them in ascending order, and you take the 25th percent point of it, so total number of points, uh, the 25th percent of that, that point is your 25th percentile, and similarly, the 75th percent point is your 75th percentile. So if you take those two points, take the difference between them, that and multiply that by 1.5, that's called the interquartile, oh, well, the difference between them is the interquartile range. And then you multiply them by 1.25, uh, I think. Do I have that in here? Well, you multiply that by 1.5 and then go beyond the 25th and the 75th percentile by that much, 
and that's your range of data that does not include outliers. So essentially, it's a good way of getting rid of outliers in your data that may not, uh, may not affect the bulk of your data. Right? And typically, when we do it on data like this, uh, which is uh, log normal in nature, we notice that it gets rid of most of those small uh, outliers on the right side, that we might have one data point at the two million mark and one data point at the one million mark, but everything else is within the first uh, 20,000. So it just gets rid of those few points at the end. And so our buckets are really useful because now they're just looking at the bulk of those data. So what I'm doing here is I'm dividing it into 25 points, uh, 25 buckets that's based on these thresholds. Right? And now, uh, so when I run these, uh, this method, what I get is thresholds based on my data, uh, 27 thresholds. So I've got the 25, and then I also created one bucket at the start for everything from zero to the first bucket, and one bucket at the end from everything from the last bucket to the last data point, right? So it's uh, my middle 25 are the actual histogram, and then first bucket and last bucket are both outliers. So I've got 27 buckets here, and if I generate my threshold, um, sorry, I, I generate my histogram using these thresholds, I now see a much better histogram. So the first, uh, the lowest outlier has a uh, bucket has 252 points. The highest one has got 14,000 points, where the bulk of the points are in the middle, all right? And uh, this will be a little more interesting when we visualize it using D3. Yeah. Yeah, that, that particular number, 1.5, is that something that comes from source experience? No, it's actually a, it's a standard published number. So you'll find it in all stats books. It's, uh, it's defined as uh, when you're doing IQR. So if you search for IQR. So you guys in SOTA have, have, have found that this applies particularly well to web performance data? Or yeah, so it, it applies for lots of data sets. Uh, with web performance data, there is one caveat. Uh, you don't want to look below zero because you typically don't have load times less than zero. Uh, all right. But that's, uh, that's the only exception we've found. Sorry? It, it does actually happen. So uh, it, it may be, an, uh, in case of the maybe browser bugs that cause numbers to be below zero, which is why I said typically doesn't happen. But um, we want to filter those out in any case. So what we do is rather than look at the exact IQR range, we cap the low end at zero. And the upper end, we just let it, uh, whatever the IQR tells us to use, we use. And if we the function, is that in there or? Uh, sorry, say that again? That yeah. Um, it probably is. So in this case, what I'm using um, is I'm using the minimum of the data set itself yeah. rather than using, uh, so I've actually massaged the data in advance to make sure there's nothing below zero. All right, so that, that's, yeah. But uh, in this case, I use the minimum as the minimum of my data set as my low bound and the maximum of my data set as the up bound. Right. So we have this histogram. Now, we can do some kind of filtering uh, similar to SQL, but not as powerful as SQL. So the isNA function is similar to the not null in SQL. Uh, NA is Julia speak for null. I think I need to change that. So I change this from I was initially looking at uh, Portland data, but my new data set has no data from Portland, oh, from Oregon, so. <laughs> so um, I'm looking at country data, uh, only data that actually has uh, a country code set to US. So in this case, I create a histogram. Uh, well, first, let's see, I, I run this, and well, let's take out the semicolon here. So if you put a semicolon at the end of any statement in Julia, It'll just not echo the result of that statement. If I take out that semicolon, it'll now echo the result. So I get this uh, thing, and this is interesting. What region is AE in the US? Oh. Is anyone, which, which state is AE? <laughs> is there a state with AE? No. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> it's, Unless that's like the, the so, yeah, it, it should be a country code, right, Arab Emirates. So, because judging by the ISP name, I'm guessing it's uh, a UAE ISP. Uh, 
but it should have been in the in the country code rather than the region code. So maybe my. Oh. Huh. Interesting. So it's it's the the U.S. base in the Middle East. Wow. So they actually use Safari in there. <laughs> and they visit websites back home. All right. Yeah, actually very consistently using Safari. All right. So uh, that's how we filter it to, to the US. And uh, I could do something else like, let's say, I wanted to look at UK. So I'd filter that to UK. And what would I get there? Nothing, because there's no UK data in there. Anyone else? I wonder, maybe all the, da all the data is from the US? No, there is German data in there. So in the, in the case, uh, one thing to note, the, the region code. So in the case of US data, it is the actual state names. Uh, in the case of all other countries in the world, it's the FIPS code for their region. So you do have to differentiate between the two if your country code is uh, US. And this is not something we invented. It's uh, what we get back from MaxMind uh, for an IP lookup. So if you do an IP lookup, you get a, uh, I just think that the US uh, does not have FIPS codes for any of the states. So that's why the rest of the world has FIPS codes. The US has uh, actual state codes. Right. And I'm sure there's an ISO standard. I just don't know what it is. Right. So once we've got that, we can uh, generate a histogram. Again, using our same old thresholds, we generate a histogram for uh, this new data. Thresholds is not doing I think I did not execute this. So I, I actually did not uh, execute all these functions, so it's not in memory. So one thing to note about the, the notebook server is it caches the HTML output in the file itself. So if you execute it once and it stores that output, the next time you load it up, it'll show you whatever it ran the last time. Um, but you can easily be fooled to thinking that all of those variables are in memory right now they may not actually be in memory. Uh, but at the same time, your kernel will last forever. So if your kernel didn't die, those variables will be in memory. In a Julia box, however, will terminate your session after 10 minutes of inactivity. So you will lose all your kernels and you will have to log in again. Uh, your notebooks will still exist though. So you won't have to recreate all of that. So let's see, I've done that and done that. Right, so I've now got a US histogram, and uh, I could also do a German histogram for the data I've just collected. So you can see much less German data. So now we'll try and see a correlation between the global and the US data, so using the car function, which does uh, Pearson's correlation between the two data sets. In this case, it's, uh, well, it's almost exactly the same point, well, 99.95% correlated between the two. If we do a, a QM sum that basically shows us the CDF of the data sets, uh, we get a much 99.99% correlated. So that shows us that the data is almost entirely uh, US because it's so heavily correlated. If I look at correlation between uh, German and the global data set, it's 73% correlated. So it's less, but it's still following the general pattern. So what we typically do with, uh, uh, when we're doing a data analysis of uh, performance data is we'll look at every dimension and we'll try and see a correlation between uh, the global data set and uh, the subset of the data that we're looking at to try and find out well, if performance problems are uh, localized to a certain region of the world or a certain browser or a certain uh, device type, like is it a Android devices specifically or iOS devices. So we'll try and take these subsets of data and do a correlation between the, the global spread of uh, data versus the, the histogram for that individual dimension. And if there is, uh, if there is a high correlation and the, the data counts, or the beacon counts are also very similar, then we'll actually ignore that subset of data because we'll say that there, you, you cannot um, determine causation from that particular data set. There's just a very strong correlation because 
the data is significantly made up of that data set. But then what we'll do is we'll subtract the two matrices and then try and get a correlation between the other dimensions. Right. So this uh, correlation function is very useful. This is uh, Pearson's correlation. There's also uh, uh, Speakman's correlation, uh, which is another function you can use. And there are actually a huge number of stats functions that I'm not going to go into. Uh, julia.readthedocs.org has a whole section in stats uh, that you can go through and read uh, at leisure. If you just go to Google and search for Julia Docs, you'll actually find them. You might have to type Julia Lang Docs, though. <laughs> I think for me, Google knows that when I search for Julia, I'm searching for the language, but it doesn't happen for everyone. <laughs> so the data frames can also do grouping. So like a group by in, uh, in SQL, you can use the by method, pass in the data frame and the column you want to group by. You can pass in one or more columns, um, and it'll group by a combination of that. So in this case, we want to group by the user agent family. And what the, our aggregate function we want to do is the median. So what we do is we say by df user agent family and specify what our roles should be. So in this case, we're going to specify just the median and aggregates it all into a large number, uh, well, I don't know how many, but more than 30 user agents. <laughs> Isn't it crazy that we have more than 30 user agents? No. <laughs> no. How, how many would you guess we should have? One. One? Well, uh, how many do you guess that we have in reality? And I'm not even counting about versions. I'm just talking about like. Yeah, I'm not even talking about version numbers. So just, uh, just the user, like AOL, Amazon Silk. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands. Oh, <laughs> sure. So we, we can actually find out how many, right? Because we can say UA is equal to this and then get a size of that. So in this case, we had uh, 36 user, user agent strings. So there, is a, you can actually get keyboard shortcuts uh, by hitting the H key in the in the notebook. You hit H, and it gives you all of your keyboard shortcuts you can use. Quick question: How yeah. do you do this? Is it uh, what your beacon sends to those? Yeah, it's from the user agent header that we get on the beacon. Yeah. So the HTTP header, and then we pass it. You the, the from the yeah. We, no, we don't do that. So we actually send the full string, and then we use a project called the user agent parser, UA parser. It started out as part of the browser stats uh, project, and then got split out into its own project. So it's on GitHub, uh, UA parser, and it'll split a user agent string into its family version, operating system, and device. And here you have just, uh, so that's uh, this is one of the columns that we have. Uh, yeah. So this is the family column. Uh, we also have the so if you go back up to the, the field names, uh, I've got the family, major version, minor version, OS, OS version, device type, and model. So you have 36 families? Yeah, 36 families. And uh, if we want to see all of them, uh, we can type uh, show all. What was the name? User rating family. So that gives me all of the, the browsers that we have available. Now I could also sort this by the count if I wanted to do it. Uh, in this case, it's the median, so I, I don't really want to sort by that. But I could sort by beacon count, and we'll look at that a little further. Uh, one thing to remember is uh, this works well when your rows function returns a, a scalar. So this returns a single element per row. But if it returns a vector or an array of elements, what your group by will end up doing is having a separate row for every element in that. So typically, if we wanted to use the histogram function here, the histogram returns, in our case, would return 27 elements. We would have 27 rows per user agent family. And we don't always want that. So what we do here is we just JSON encode the histogram so that we get a string here, which is a scalar. 
So in this case, we've got um, the data frame. We've got rows that we've, uh, we're going to return as a data frame. We've got a count, median, and the histogram. And so it's now three columns, three aggregate columns. The first two are numbers. Third one looks like an array. It's actually a string containing an array, a string containing a JSON encoded array. All right. And again, it's the same 36. So now what we can do is uh, we have this JSON, and we can copy it uh, to JavaScript file uh, when testing. So one thing that I've learned is that the simpler your testing setup, the easier it is to debug. So rather than have the whole D3 and Julia combination set up at this point, what I did was have uh, D3 code written separately. And then I'd come to this point where I would do uh, print ln histogram JSON JSON this, and then I would select this and hit command C and go into my editor and do command V and then debug the code there, right? Because it's way simpler than having to run this notebook every time and figure out which part of the thing has gone wrong. So what we'll do is here we'll uh, well you, I won't do it because I've already written the code in advance, but you could uh, go ahead and do that if you're debugging JSON code. Uh, D3 code, copy the thresholds and the histogram, and paste it into D3. All right. So let's see. we're going to do one more before we move on to D3. All right. And this one is really uh, more about the JavaScript, not about the Julia code, but the kind of JavaScript that we're going to do, um, and what's going to lead into talking to to D3. So. In order to communicate with between JavaScript and D3, uh, well, between Julia and JavaScript, what we want to be able to do is create DOM nodes and then update those nodes uh, with subsequent calls. So to do that, uh, well, how do you update a node in JavaScript, right? You first need to know an, an ID or some kind of selector that selects that node. So what we're going to do in, uh, in Julia is create an ID that's a random string. So in this case, we do something like demo node and a random number. Uh, this is probably not a legal ID value in, uh, in HTML because it has a dot in it, and dots are not valid in IDs, but we don't care. Uh, it also is less likely to collide with something that uh, is already on the page because it's got illegal elements. Right? So we'll create a node with this element uh, simply by doing uh, display text HTML and ID is equal to this particular display ID. Um, apart from the actual display ID, a few things to note about this particular line. Uh, first, I use the triple double quote uh, syntax, which is similar to if you program in Python, you'd be familiar with this. It lets you create a multi-line string. So triple double quote, quote, and then you can type in all the text you want and close it with another triple double quote. Second is uh, string uh, coalescing. So if you have a variable, or in fact, in Julia, any Julia code, and you enclose it in dollar parenthesis, it'll, inside a string, it'll execute that string. This is uh, something they borrowed from Perl and then expanded completely. So in, in the case of Perl, you could put in a variable with a dollar sign inside a string, or in the case of PHP as well. In the case of Julia, you can put any Julia code inside a string, <laughs> and it'll execute, and the result will be uh, put into that string. So in this case, all I'm doing is putting the display ID in here. And then uh, a few other things. So when I execute this code, let's execute all of this. So execute that, and then I execute this. So it creates this uh, paragraph element. And if I inspect it, I should see the, the appropriate ID there. So in this case, it's got the same ID as this thing here, all right? Now we're going to do another illegal thing in JavaScript. We're going to create a function that has the name of this, uh, that has this ID as its name. And this, so remember, this function name now has a dash and a dot in it, both of which are in, illegal for JavaScript uh, identifiers. But we don't care. <laughs> because we're, we're not going to call it an identifier. We're calling, going to call it a property of the window object which uh, just so happens that JavaScript doesn't care whether it's uh, what it is. Any, any property of the window object is a global, and therefore, if it happens to be a reference to a function, you can call it. So we create a window 
display ID, and it's a function. Uh, we will almost always use this exact same function regardless of the, the ID. In this case, it takes in text as a parameter and updates um, using inner text, update that element's text to whatever we pass in. So let me run that. And then later on, we can call this particular code, which calls window, display ID, and in parenthesis, any text that we want to update into that node. So if I run this now, so first notice that it says nothing here. If I run this now and go up, it's updated that to hello world, right? So a very simple example of how we reference and update nodes that have been created uh, prior to the execution of this particular cell, right? There's nothing stopping, There's nothing stopping you from using it. It's just uh, I'm too lazy. I mean, I could have used an underscore and I could have gotten rid of the dot and it would be perfectly legal, right? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it's also less likely to be a collision between, like I, I always assume that my code is gonna be in somebody else's web page. So, because I, I'm a third party script author. So my page, uh, my code is almost always in somebody else's web page. But uh, I'm not asking you to write illegal code. <laughs> So I am now gonna move on to D3, so we'll go back to my slides. And any questions so far about the Julia part? There's more Julia, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> 